Welcome once again to another edition of the Brazilian Shirt Name Podcast. The legend Dino is looking elegant as always in Rio. Good morning. Thank you very much. Sorry, I said good morning. Is it morning there? It, it's uh, it's on the cusp. We've just gone midday on a on a winter. It's kind of it's it, there's sunshine, but it's going to be dark by six o'clock. And you know, it's one of those things that makes me makes me miss the European summer. Yeah, you, you had your fun, I you did. had your summer, and you I were did. crowing about it, telling mm -hmm. us how hot it was. Mm -hmm. But it's our turn. Mm -hmm. um, Theo, Theo Delaney uh, from Live Girls Podcast is with us. Uh, Hi, Theo, guys. How hot is it where we are? Do you want to well, tell it's pretty, Tim? Uh, it's reasonably hot, I would say. I don't know. Yeah. I, I couldn't put a figure on it, but, I mean, it's it's not cool, is it? I'm wearing a T-shirt. I've got the window open. I, I, I'm not wearing anything at all. <laughs> I know. I can, can see that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> keep, keep your eyes where they belong. <laughs> now, honestly, it's great to have you back on the podcast, Theo. We've got a lot to talk about. And I can't believe, Tim, that we haven't talked about this match before. It is because bizarre, course, isn't it? It is bizarre. It's weird. Oh, my goodness. As soon as I realised what it was, not to talk of that my missus is in the charts as well. Good point. I'm, I'm, um, I, th I was still waiting for you to bring that up. I'm no longer <laughs> still waiting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll tell her that we were talking about it later on. By the way, that's my favourite record in the charts. So we'll come to that later <laughs> on. As we always do on the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast, uh, we talk about a particular match from some time in the firmament of football history, and we try and look at the sort of wider context, not just remembering the match, but also remember the, remembering the circumstances and the soundtrack. And honestly, this match, circumstances, everybody has a stake in this one, I think. So it was the 4th of July, 1990. I think I know where we're going with this. Italia 90. Theo, do you remember it? Oh, yeah. I certainly remember it, yeah, vividly. I mean, it's, it's strangely, I don't know if it's a generational thing, but it's the one that people... Well, I mean, partly I think it's because it's pivotal, wasn't it? Most people think it was the start of modern football. Mm. Before that, in 89, we'd had the, the Anfield game where Arsenal beat Liverpool live on the television. And then we had that with Lineker and Gascoigne and the tears and, or, and all of that and England going deep into the tournament. And it's thought that that it is generally accepted that that's what gave rise to the Premier League and to all the live coverage and to, crucially, to middle class moneyed people going to football. And then you got uh, all seater stadiums, blah, 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 and the rest is history. And here we are in, in 2024 with this kind of glossy capitalist dream of a sport. Yeah, because it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's only, no, it's, it's, it's just a year after Hillsborough, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, uh, and around that time, there was almost a consensus through the mid 80s to Hillsborough that football was dying. Yeah. Well, and, Thatcher wanted to ban it yeah. after Heisel. She Indeed. said, I don't really understand. I keep seeing all these people fighting each other and all sorts of trouble. Can't we just ban it? <laughs> she didn't really. She, she, that's how little regard she had for it. And, and then, in actual fact, lots of people, obviously people come on my podcast, have been going to football since, some of them since the 50s. But some, some people say I stopped going in the 80s because it, was, yeah. it felt too dangerous and nasty and horrible. Well, well it, was, so, it, it was very nihilistic, wasn't it, for, for yeah, a lot of that time? Yeah, it was. And I, I, agree, yeah. I, I agree with that line that this tournament, the Premier League, the success of the Premier League wouldn't have been possible as quickly without this tournament. I agree with that 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 line because it the whole England story. It was a very very disappointing World Cup. Otherwise, you know, it was the lowest number of goals per games. There was a lot of dreary football. It was after this tournament that FIFA cracked down on the tackle from behind to try and give talent more uh, more opportunity to to shine. So in some ways, it was a low point, but. Most of the great games in this tournament were England games. Most of the, dr the, the dramatic games in this tournament were, were mm -hmm. England games. And and this one, the semi-final against Germany, was a fantastic game of football that ebbed yeah. and flowed over the course of 120 minutes. It was a wonderful yeah. game of football with all of the added drama of, you know, Gascoigne and the tears and, and, and so on. And I, I often think that, that the clubs are always ungrateful when it comes to international football. They don't realise how many people, or they do realise, but they, they, they prefer to ignore, how many mm. people come into the game through the gateway of the national team yeah, and, and, and then, then become fans from that. And th this 1990, it wasn't only that it, it, it won a new lot of supporters, it also reminded so many people of why they had, had been in love with football in the past. 
absolutely. I mean, England hadn't gone that far in the tournament in my... I, I was 24 at the time and I was football mad. You know, it had been since I was a tiny child, but England had never been that far in a tournament. It got To me, it was that was something that England never did. You know, and of course, it's, it's especially precious for us, Theo, because it was our triumph. Well, it was a Tottenham. It was, it was a Tottenham, it was a, it was a Tottenham triumph, and um, yeah. it, it, it's amazing to think back on this because this is at a time before there was there was wall to wall televised football. But in Absolutely. the in the months going up to the World Cup, we were probably watching certainly a candidate for the best player in the world, and Paul Gascoigne in those those months going up. And I, I vividly remember a game against Man United towards the end of the season when he he, he just touched us. And, yeah. But we knew. But the rest of the country didn't really know because they That's hadn't right. seen That's right. He was it. a late pick. He was a late pick, wasn't he? Yeah, because it hadn't been much on the telly. But him and Platt were both late picks. I remember right. going to see in that season uh, Spurs play Villa and both those players were emerging uh, as possibles. And I was like, will they take Gascoigne? Will they take Platt? They'll probably only take one of them and all of that. And as it turned out, there were two of the tournament's standout players. They probably, I mean, I don't, I can't remember what the to- team of the tournament was. We wouldn't be surprised to find them both in it. I mean, Platt with that incredible last minute winner against uh, Belgium would really announced himself. And then, and then, I mean, Gaza was, yeah, he was amazing throughout. But as you say, if you're a Tottenham fan, I had a season ticket from the late eighties onwards. And I always say, we had Paul Gascoigne recently on the Spurs show. And it was, I'd never met him before. It was an incredible, it was like a religious experience. Yeah. And he, I always say that I had a season ticket the season before Italia 90 and the season after Italia 90. And that was when you saw the best Gaza. And as you say, I mean, you rarely see a better player than that in football history. He was so good. I, I well remember before England's first game of the tournament, which was Republic of Ireland, a dreadful game played in a gale. Yeah. Uh, admittedly, he's a Scot. But Kenny Dalglish was on like, the BBC and they were talking about who the England team should be. And there was, should Gascoigne be in there? And Dal- Dalglish wouldn't have it. He said, no, 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 I, 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 I far prefer Steve McMahon. Which, as the, the, the way that that tournament panned out, you know. <laughs> there you go. Uh, yeah. Well, were you an England supporter? Did you did you not go, Theo? Because you've been to England games before. We spoke. I've been. To, I didn't go. go. I was skint. In the, I was very skint. I didn't go. I know people who went. I know what people who went. I mean, I I've gone to games like that on the spur of the moment. Subsequently, but that I was on the uppers, and I uh, so I watched it all on the telly. I had mates who actually got in the car you know, that morning and just said, sod wow. this, we're going, you know, and I, and I did that subsequently in the subsequent World Cups. But no, I watched this game in with my extended family. So I come from a family of football fans. My dad's the oldest of eight. And there must have been 30 plus of us in one living room in uh, the salubrious surroundings of Holland Park. I remember in this townhouse in Holland Park, one of my well-to-do uncles had this house and we were jammed in. You could barely move. And for some reason, we all felt like we all had to watch it together. And um, that all added to the, the, you know, and in those days also, I would, I mean, I would have been six or seven beers down eat comfortably by the start of it but when you're young like that and you drink you can still focus I remember the game it's not like I don't remember it for, because I was so drunk I was completely tuned into the game I think it was only alcohol yeah I think so and and it was absolutely gripping as you say the, the thing you can easily forget because everyone remembers the drama everyone remembers the tears everyone remembers the moments like the equaliser and the missed penalties but it's easy to forget that it was actually like you said Tim, it's like one of the best games, just straightforwardly entertaining two hours of football, mm. you know, you're ever going to see, really. And not In, just because the stakes were so Including high. extra time. Absolutely. Including Lots extra, happened extra in extra time. time. Drama-packed, yeah. drama-packed extra time. You had Gaza's tears. I mean, Waddle hit the post in extra time with a fantastic effort. And at that point, you're watching it thinking, this is an injustice. We should win this game. It's not right. And then... Not long after that, Argentala hits the post with just as good a shot, you know, that could have gone in. Really good shot. Yeah, it was and you book, it's it was actually, I, or uh, oh, was it Bookbolt? Yeah, or Butchvald, as uh, Trevor Brooking would uh, always <laughs> refer, <laughs> refer to. I mean, you know, I think 
I think, as I recall, I think it was an even game, two good teams playing well. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how well Germany had played up to them, but what I do remember, I don't know if you thought this recently in the in the, the World Cup that's just, or, or rather the Euros that just been, and you think of all the stick Southgate was getting, and I'm thinking to myself, all that stick, he got so much stick from the papers, from the public, and from the bloody pundits in the TV studios. And I was thinking, this reminds me of Italia 90, because Robson... I mean, he'd been getting stick for years and he's getting more. England, like you say, that first game against Ireland, absolutely dire. I think we beat Egypt 1-0, but, but you know, really scraped past them. The only game we played OK in was against Holland because we'd risen, risen to the occasion yeah, in the group. There was a Belgian game as well, which I, I don't think people well, realise yeah. how good how good that Belgian side were. Absolutely. They, they'd been semi, all... Yeah, they'd been semi-finalists in 86 and I think they were better this yeah. time around. And that was a yeah. terrific game. That was a wonderful, wonderful yeah. game. But then, of course, yeah. came Cameroon. And I mean, the expectation was that England <laughs> would roll them over easily. And, you know, and Cameroon were, they should have put us to bed, you know. Definitely. During there was only a bit half. of, it was only, I think they had obviously a lack of tournament uh, uh, experience. experience. Of that. So, yeah. The, yeah, I mean, they, 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 they lost they, they a little bit of discipline, but they, were, they well, outplayed they? England. They were insane. They were I remember the, the headline yeah. after yeah. Their, their, the first game where they beat Argentina, one of the big shocks. But my God, did they launch into some insane tackles and two of them got yeah. sent off. Yeah. And there was a headline in one of the tabloids, the Looney Rooms. And I thought that was... <laughs> <laughs> and in the well, end, that, that, that lack of defensive discipline cost them and they, they gave yeah, away Yeah, I mean, the they gave away two pen, two penalties, didn't they? And that's the only that's the only reason they lost. I mean, it was just... I mean, any any sort of... If it had been Germany in their position, I mean, we would have absolutely... No, they would have shut it down. It would have been out. And quite rightly, I mean, Cameroon... I've, I mean, I remember watching that game with my again with my brothers and my dad. My dad's one of those people who just absolutely slag off England the whole way through. Oh, this is rubbish. This team, they're much better than us. Robson hasn't got a clue. They uh, never picked the right play. We were never any, we been good in any game at all. And then when they, when England went ahead and scored, he's up going, yes! Yeah. Yeah. Taking credit for it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah well, exactly. There's that, there's that Paddy Power adverts that, that's like that, isn't it? You know, there's a Paddy Power advert where they're sitting in the pub and they're talking about ruminating that the 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 uh, dark side of their town, the other team, have just been yeah. bought up by some rich millionaires, yeah. and then they say, oh, "We'll never do that. Uh, We're a proper yeah. club, yeah. was yeah. we'd yeah. never yeah. do yeah. that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. we've just been bought up." <laughs> 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 yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, that's football all over, isn't it? That yeah, is absolutely it football. Is. And you look at that is. tournament. England was slagged off. Pretty much throughout. I mean, the, the plat goal aside, everybody got a massive. I mean, that was a huge moment, the euphoria of that. But mm. generally, the manager was deemed to be crap. The team were not were not any good. And then everybody then then you know because we played well, didn't even win, but played well in the semi final in an epic semi final against one of the great powerhouses. Next thing you know, oh. Bobby Robson's got knighted. Yeah, you yeah. know, and you just yeah. think everyone's well, forgotten. Not not just one of the great powerhouses, because I mean, one thing that. I was struck by, as we were you know, remembering this particular match, I was struck by the fact that we remember things very differently. You see, when you said earlier on, Tim, that this wasn't a great Italian night, I was like, wasn't it? I, in my memory, yeah. it was a great Italian yeah, it, well, night. It's great from the English point of view. Exactly. Um, but even on the, the Germany, final was so terrible. The final was such an awful final. game of football. Yeah. But even I think oh, some of the Germans don't remember it with a with, with a great deal of of, of but remember, uh, joy. Th this is only within a year of reunification, yeah. wasn't it? And uh, Frank Beckenbauer is the coach. He yeah. says half the you know the qualifying rounds they had their mind on reunification. And they were still technically West Germany, even yeah. though yeah. they should have really been Germany now. So they're, they're, it was a good time to catch them. Although, you know, they've still got Klinsmann up front, you know, talking and, about... And Tottenham. Lotto Mateos in, in, in midfield. Oh, yeah. he was amazing. I, they, yeah, I, I'm, amazing. I well, because I lived this tournament with, you know, oh, to be 25 again, you know, in a, in the long, hot summer of 1990. Yeah. Uh, and going into the semi, they are clear favourites. Now, England have kind of stumbled and bumbled their way through. The Germans, they destroyed a very good Yugoslavia side during the group phase. And then in a knockout phase, they beat Holland. And Holland were the European champions from 88 uh, and, and seen as one of the big favourites. And they, they beat mm. Holland. They beat Czechoslovakia. Uh, and so they're, they're coming into this game as favourites. And my big fear was I didn't imagine us winning. 
my big fear is we're going to get humiliated. Especially, mm. you look at the England team. Admittedly, during the course of the tournament, he surprised everyone by playing a sweeper, which is not mm. something he'd looked at at all. You know, he, he did it in the middle of the tournament. Brought in Mark yeah. Wright behind uh, um, Terry Butcher and, and Des Walker. Uh, so there was that defensive cover. But you look at the midfield trio, it's Waddle, Gascoigne and Platt. And Platt mm. had only recently been converted from being an out-and-out striker. Yeah. And that, that's the midfield trio. And there was a great... I remember watching, watching this in a, in a pub. I watched all the games in a, in a, in a, in a pub. Uh, I can still remember the um, couple of women who were wandering around in t-shirts <laughs> saying, unleash the bull. They were Steve Ball fans. And, uh, <laughs> all right. Um, you were in when, the Midlands then? <laughs> no, I wasn't. I wasn't. But the Midlands will always, the Midlands will always find you one way or the other. Um, <laughs> and when the team was read out, there was a groan about Peter Beardsley. John, he come in for John Barnes, who was injured. Yeah. And yeah. Beardsley was a magnificent player, but yeah. I think he was tired. And I remember I'd been in the stadium for the, the FA Cup semi final a couple of months before when Liverpool lost to Palace. And he wasn't firing on all cylinders. And there was that groan when, oh, Beardsley. You actually had a, had, had a, had a, had a, had a pretty good game. But the ex, you look at that side and you think, who on earth is going to win the ball for us in, in, in midfield? So my, my, my fear going into the game is that they are just going to, you know, Mateos is just going to walk through us. As Cameroon had, had, had done for especially the start of the second half in 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 the previous round, so that that was my my mood there at kickoff time is, can we just not be humiliated, please? Mm. And then the opening few minutes, Gascoigne just grabs the game by the scruff of the neck, and you're thinking, we're in this, we're in this, mm. and I'd never. It was the first point at which I thought, you know what, I think we can win this World Cup. Uh, and uh, that 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 feeling never left me all the way through the, through through the ebbs and flows of 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 of, of the hundred and twenty minutes. Yeah, it was a strange game uh, uh, team. It had evolved, hadn't it? But I think there was talk that the players had told Robson what to do. They yeah, said, although, oh, this isn't I, working. I, I haven't heard anyone confirm that. That that yeah. That, uh, and that most of the players said Robson decided that he would switch the team. Okay. To, to, okay. to three centre backs. I mean, it he certainly kind of, worked, didn't it? And because the one Wright who isn't was a great there, ball playing centre half, wasn't he? He was, yeah. And the one who isn't there, and maybe this is something which is forced to change, is Brian Robson. Because going into the tournament, he is the man. You know, but he's yeah. always getting injured and he gets injured again. Yeah. And and and, uh, and 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 he would have been the midfield anchor man. Uh, and maybe the loss of him makes makes uh, Bobby but Robson think, all if, right, if it, we'll, we'll, we'll have the sweeper behind. If it was Kenny Dalglish, of course, we'd have had Steve McMahon in there. He did play the first game. He, he gave away the goal. Uh, right. I think when, he the end of the, him. when he came off the bench, I think right. he came off the bench. And it was his miscontrol against Ireland. He miscontrolled right. the ball and Kevin Sheedy latched onto it and, 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 and put, it in, put it in the back of the net. Um, mm-hmm. So, uh, and so as the game starts and, and it, it's all about Gascoigne for the first few minutes. He goes close a couple of times and you're thinking... My God, we could do we could do this, you know, and the expectation was, so Argentina are already in the final. They've they've beaten Italy on penalties the previous night. The expectation is now, we're going to be world champions. We're going to be world champions, and it's yeah. so close, but so far. Yeah, yeah. Well, that I mean, oh hello, the um, the the German goal actually was of course a real fluke. It was a total fluke, wasn't it? It was on the so actually if you look at the game objectively, the England goal was a good goal. And a brilliant finish by Gary Lineker. Superb. That's one of those moments, you know, as you know, on my on my podcast Live Goals, it's all about those goals that make you feel so electrified that you can never forget. That is definitely in that the Lineker equalizer is an incredible an incredible moment because you're just thinking, oh we're going out here. It's all gone wrong. And he and he does what Lineker does. It's a superb finish. But the um, the Germany goal is a horrible goal because it's a it's a shot that gets deflected off Paul Parker and loops over Shilton. Years later, I met Paul Parker in a television studio, who's a who's a bit of a character. He was quite quite a character, 
And obviously it came up. Of course, he must be so bored of people bringing it up over the years, you know. But instead of him going, yeah, yeah, and coming up with a pat answer and just wanting to move on in a bored way, he immediately got very animated about it. And he blamed it 100% on Peter Shilton. You're he joking, said that really? was entirely, that was entirely Shilton's fault. He should never have let that in. And I wow. was looking at it earlier. I thought, I'll look at those wow. goals again. And I looked at it and there's a great angle from behind the goal. And of course, as we know, the, the ball, I, is it Bramer, I think, hits it and it, it comes up. It hits Paul Parker, totally blameless. He's just trying to charge it down. He's charging Bramer down. The ball hits him at very close range, loops over. We've seen it happen lots of times and goes over Shilton's head. But two things occurred to me watching it. One was Shilton was a big unit by then. He looked yeah. like somebody's somebody's dad, didn't he? It was, it was like really a big unit. And he was quite a way off his line. I think that's what Paul Park, Parker's talking about. I mean, it's strange from a free kick to be that far off your line. You don't tend to see that from goalkeepers. And so not only was he far from the line, he wasn't that mobile. I mean, I don't know. I think he'd struggle to get a game at Man City these days. Good, mm -hmm. good goalkeeper, though he was in many other ways. So I think what Paul Parker's thinking is, that ball was in the air for about half an hour. That's what it felt like, didn't it? It's mm -hmm. looping, looping. You're going, no, no, no. And he was too far forward to get back to do anything about it. And so Parker, that, the two things that struck me was one, actually, I think Parker's got a point there. And the other thing that struck me is you see Parker, <laughs> you see Parker looking in horror, watching the ball, looking at Shilton. And when it goes in, you just see Parker in a really subtle way go, oh, as if to say, you idiot, Shilton. <laughs> Even at that moment. <laughs> He's blaming Shilton and he was absolutely adamant that it was Shilton's fault. And I think right. he might, I do think he might have a case. Well, Shilton was a goalkeepers in the modern game would let that in. He was a, at this point in his career, he was big when he? he was a great shot stopper. Yeah. yeah uh, I remember some of the saves he made, in, in, I think in the Egypt game, you know, when it was nil nil and hairy. Great shot yeah. stopper. But, yeah. and we see this in the penalties as well. He, he isn't as mobile as, 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 he, once, no. as he once was. Um, one of the cliches that's always used in football is a cruel deflection. Deflections are always cruel. Yeah. But it's a cliche because it's true. Isn't it? There, there, yeah. Could anything be crueler than, 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 than this, this deflection? Yeah. I mean, oh. you know, the goals go in because you're not in the right place at the right time, generally. Um, and, deflections are part of the game it's like when you play five a side and people use the wall it's so infuriating especially when you know that one-on-one -on -one you could get the ball off them but actually on a five a side pitch that wall is part of the rebound you know and yeah. you, you always forget that people mm -hmm. can use it and that's sometimes what happens with goalkeepers i mean i'm not sure whose fault it was but what I remember then was, uh, you know, we knew that it wasn't going to end uh, when it was supposed to end, that there was more drama to come. And I feel like the lead up to the penalties, which we'll talk about, obviously, the lead up to the penalties was probably the most dramatic part of this match. The, you know, the extra time into the penalties. What do you reckon? Well, even the free kick that Germany got, because everything happens in a context of football, even if there, there, are, there are lucky breaks here and there. But the free kick that Germany got is a consequence of that space in front of the England back four or back five. Mm. You know, mm. and, and Germany, yeah. is, as, especially as the game goes on, they're getting into that space with, with, with worrying ease, you know, with that, that England mm -hmm. midfield trio of, of, of Platt, Wadlin and Gascoigne. So they, do, they are able to, to break into that space, but always... The test of a team is when you go a goal down, isn't it? It's always the test. And yeah. even rose to, to that challenge. And I'm actually glad if we got to lose, much, much better that we lose on penalties than it stays 1-0 and that goal decides things. Because mm -hmm. that, that, you know, that, that, was, that would have been such a horrible way to, to define a place in a, in, in, a, in a World Cup final, that horrible loot, loot deflected you, goal. Do you think, though, that when it went into penalties, were you still of the belief that England were going to win the World Cup? Yeah, because this was the first of a series of, you know, <laughs> penalty well, shootouts. First time England were in penalties, you know, the first time exactly. so we, we've never we've been never there before. We've never experienced that before. Well, we've, we've got some road to, to, to cover until then, because there is the goal, which 
as you mentioned, it's just a masterclass of Lineker, you know, isn't it? The, yeah. The way that yeah. the ball goes across him and he cushions it and then whatever foot it comes on, this was his left foot back across. Yeah. It just yeah. makes it, he makes the difficult look easy in, in the reduced yeah. space. It's a, it, it's, it's, it's a lovely little microcosm of, of, of his, his art as a, as a penalty area poacher. But yeah. then this is the thing that I hadn't, I hadn't remembered in pre VAR days. You know, decisions happened and you just got on with it. I think we scored a goal. Uh, it's the, the, the free kick. Yes. The free yes. kick to Chris Waddle. And, and David yeah. Black glances it in and it's ruled out. The flag goes up, offside, yeah, carry yeah. on again. You look at it yeah. and you think, he's onside. Not offside. Yeah. And I mean, no I was one, wondering, no he was at... About that at the time or since. It was just one of those things, you know, it's part of the game, get on with it, no goal. Yeah, yeah. He was at least level. There was another forward who might have been slightly ahead of him. And I couldn't remember. Do you remember when they changed it to you have to be active or interfering with play to be considered? Oh, yeah. so, so I wondered if they'd given it for the other striker and whether it was still about that. was Because the other striker yeah. looked like he might be more off. So I can't remember who it was. Presumably it was might have been Lineker. I don't know. Might have been Platt. Or is it Platt? I don't know. But um, it's certainly... No, hold on. Platt was the guy who scored it. Yeah. So Platt was... Onside, um, I, it was it was comfortably onside, and as you say, VAR would have wouldn't have even taken two seconds to to give uh, that goal. And it's so weird how it all changes because no, I you had say, no memory of that whatsoever. There wasn't the slightest yeah. controversy at, at the time. You know, flag's gone no. up, so uh, so it doesn't count. Just shows you, just shows you how football changes so much because it's like nobody moans about it now. Nobody was moaning about it, yeah, like you said afterwards. And now people say, yeah, but you've got to have VAR because otherwise. No, I actually, I mean, although that was, that was yeah. an injustice, it was an injustice and for binary decisions that you can make very, very quickly, fine. But I don't really miss that, that idea that a referee yeah. or a linesman can make a mistake, which is an easy one to make because it's a very, very fine, because it was fine. It was a fine margin. We're, sure. we're looking at it over and over again, aren't we? And deciding and knowing. But I, I actually, yeah, I preferred it like that. So even uh, d- divine retribution, <laughs> perhaps for sixty-six. Yeah, perhaps. Yeah, of course, because yeah. they look at it that way as well. But also, yeah, I no, think yeah. you, you would, you would. I mean, it, it, Waddle, as you said, Theo hit the post with a with a terrific shot, brilliant yeah. shot. He had a great game, yeah. Waddle, and you saw yeah, him there as yeah. as a midfielder. Um, he had a terrific game, um, but Germany had more chances in extra time than we did. Now, Klinsmann right. had, had a couple. There was one he put yeah. just wide. There was a header he had. He had he had saved, and mm-hmm. uh, in the end, I think, yeah, all right, okay, penalties. And we didn't know. Yeah. I didn't know what to think. No, because we've never what? done it before, like we've you say. Everyone thought it, penalties. The the, the common uh, conventional wisdom at the time was that penalties are a lottery. It's a Indeed. complete lottery. We've got the Gascoigne tears before before then. Oh and, yeah, uh, of course. And of course. The, the, the referee was Brazilian. Uh, yeah. Right, I don't know where he gets his name. Right, you know, with the English spelling. Uh, and I, sure, I, it's righty. Yeah. Righty. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. Uh, and I used to see him in the in, in the stadium in the Maracanã. And one time, I, I I told him, you know what, you changed English football. That yellow <laughs> card that you gave. Yeah. And he had, he had no idea. Well, yeah. Oh, really? Did I? Yeah. He had really? absolutely not the slightest idea. Of the importance of that decision in in, in the culture of yeah. the English game, and mm. maybe maybe so, maybe wider English society, you know. Yeah, well, well, yeah. Uh, yeah it's funny place. you say that. Well, yeah, because exactly because it, it changed football as we know because it was this iconic image at a pivotal point in the development of football. But as you say, I, I remember telling my kids that men didn't cry before that. It was not no. acceptable for men to cry. No, I mean, you just public. didn't. I, I, would, I had trained yeah. myself at the age of 24 to not shed a tear. I don't think I'd shed did, one did, for about eight years. Because did your you old man never tell you? Did you? Because well, my old man literally told oh, me, yeah. Oh, yeah. you're a disgrace what, for cry. crying in public. Of yeah. course. Oh, yeah, yeah of course. Yeah, no, it's a well-known phrase Wake that everyone accepted. Yeah, 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 everyone accepted that boys don't cry. And suddenly... I can't do it to this day. Cry. I can't. I can't do it. I can't do it. Yeah, it's horrible. It's horrible. I mean, oh, I do I struggle. I struggle it. with it, but you know, sometimes <laughs> emotions get the better of you. Um, but no, it, it's a really important cultural point. Um, but it couldn't. It's one of those things where the drama is almost written before it happens. You know, the the whole country was focused on 
um, as we've already said, on uh, on something happening from Gascoigne. And then suddenly this yellow card comes out of nowhere. And I think for us all, the um, emotion got the better of us because we felt like crying too. Um, yeah. Because we knew that he was the, uh, the talisman for the England team. And I think at that point, we were still expecting to get to the final. And you can you, see you know, it from... When he got the yellow card, honestly, I cared less about whether we got to the final or not. Really? Mm. Yeah, yeah, I did yeah because mm. we'll have to play the final without the final him. Final without not, him, not yeah, be the same. Wouldn't have been as good. Yeah, yeah. You see, I wasn't like that. I, I, when you saw the players, and particularly you didn't watch famous... him every week, so you know you didn't have the bond that, that me and Theo had. This with him. is true. This mm. is true. Um, but when you saw particularly the, um, the the famous look of Lineker to Bobby yeah. Robson off, uh, um, you know, by the sidelines, and you know, saying, "Watch him, watch him," because look, he, he's mm. uh, not only is he in tears, but also but he's he likely to, sort to of do something reckless. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, watch him. At that point, it felt like, oh, gosh, they all know that he's going to miss the final and we're yeah. in it. You know, th th yeah. that's the way that it, uh, I remember yeah. it so yeah. much. And, um, of course, that deflected away in the next morning's papers, away from the England team's lack of success. Mm. Deflected because, I don't know if you remember, but he was the story and all the sort of front pages had him in tears, almost as if he represented the tears of the country yeah. not getting through as well. It could have only happened with him. I think if any other players had bored in tears, it wouldn't have been a story. Mm. We yeah. wouldn't be talking about he, it today. He had that unique appeal because he was like a child. He never, he's, never, mm. he's never stopped being a child. People yeah. still love him because he's like a child, but he's like a brilliant child. The things that he was able to do was so, you know, endearing in terms of his skill, but his personality was childlike. It, it, uh, and that's why, yeah, as you say, I mean, if you'd had any of the others, <laughs> Gary Lineker had started to blub <laughs> on the pitch. Uh, I mean, it would have been probably possibly less. It would have been the same it, thing. It, it, no. It was an amazing thing. Only, like you say, only really he... And because at this point, loads of intellectuals got involved. And there, was, mm -hmm. there were lots of like intellectual yeah. stuff written yeah. about him. And, and yeah. some of it good, some of it nonsense. Uh, and, and one of the most nonsensical things, because I think it really got down to a debate about Britishness or Englishness. Uh, yeah. And one of the things I saw them, that they'd written was, he, he's, he's a Latin trapped in a Geordie's body. <laughs> and I, I, I can't think with the knowledge I have now of Latin societies, I can't think mm. of anything, anything wider of the mark. Firstly, because there's this view of Latin societies as being free and easy and so on. When in fact, that emotional, but yeah, but emotional. absolutely rules dominated, you know, and as Gascoigne found out when he went to Italy, you know, and there's a microphone put in front of him and he belches, you, there is no yeah. way that you can, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so what, what, what he was, 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 he, he was like an absolutely hyped up super version of one of us where yeah. there is no off switch. You know, yeah. they, we, you had those kids at school. They were just absolutely manic. Yeah, hyper. totally hi hyperactive. Yeah, that's, yes. what, that's what it used to be called. There are other more, more scientific terms for it now. But in those days, you just said, oh, he's hyperactive. He's hyperactive. Too many E numbers. Yeah, those yeah. outbursts he used to do, the belch. The other, what about the one where he goes to Norway and he's in the yeah. press conference? Have you, got, have you got a message for the people of Norway, Paul? Yeah, fuck, fuck off, off Norway. Norway. <laughs> <laughs> but that thing about intellectualising it all, there's a guy who is a very famous critic and poet, called, or, or I say very famous, in that rarefied little world, you know, intellectual world, called Ian Hamilton, who's, at, whose son is a friend of mine. He was a huge um, Tottenham fan, Ian Hamilton. And he was, he sort of discovered people like Ian McEwan and Martin Amis, and they all worshipped him. And he ran a, a literary, you know, magazine. And Soiree. Had a, um, yeah, and he had a salon <laughs> a sort of thing. Yeah, he, he wrote the book I'm about to mention was a granter yeah. Yeah. publication, which was called Gaza Agonistes. Yeah. I mean, how, oh. how you know, and it was a, it was a, it was a book, you know, it was a, and it was all about Gaza, his whole, whole thing, what he represented in his, his, you know, moved to Italy and everything. It was amazing. He, he permeated all areas of the culture. And who would have ever thought a footballer would do that? Yeah.
let, let alone mm. one one who goes fuck off no way <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you 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 did wonder coming out of this tournament you wondered what his future was going to be yeah you no know, and- yeah it was tough for him after this, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. When 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 he reached that level of of mad I mean, celebrity, he was the most famous person in Britain and one of the most famous people in the world, wasn't he? Yeah. Apart from that time when he goes to court, <laughs> and the High Court judge, I can't remember what he's charged with, but he goes to court like later that year, and the uh, barrister says, uh, "My lord, Mister Gascoigne is a professional footballer," and the judge says, "Oh." Yes. Rugby or association. <laughs> <laughs> the, cl- the, class- yeah, yeah. the classic out of touch judge. Yeah, yeah. The only bloke in the country who doesn't know who he is. <laughs> yeah, well, um, and, but, yeah, what could have been? What, yeah. Is anyone built for that level of celebrity? You know, is that, and he, he certainly wasn't, Funny. was he? Do you know, I think it's about the times. I think today, many of those players are built for that kind of celebrity and, in fact, hire people to ensure that they're able to deal with it. But I, I, I remember very clearly uh, George Best saying that, look, I was the only one, you know, who had to deal with that. It's a kind of a similar yeah. thing that I've yeah. heard Elvis Presley talk about, you know, that... Yeah. Listen, you know, now you've got loads of rock and rollers, but remember then yeah. in 55, I was the only one. And it's a very lonely place when, and I think that's what why I admire Gary Lineker actually, because he was the one that did the right thing. He understood that, look, this guy is on a different level emotionally and otherwise. And um, in short, or he's not the only one. I know several uh, footballers tried to ensure that uh, Gaza was all right. But yeah, Gary no, Mabbott notably as well. Yeah, yeah. indeed, indeed. Yeah. Um, I mean, when I so I, I was just no, the say, point um, I was going to make, Theo. Yeah, yeah, sorry, we're talking over each other. The point I was just going to make finally is just that um, it's it's very difficult to put yourself, even in footballers today, to put yourself in the position that he was in, where an entire and, and George Best was horrible to him. Really was awful. It? Was it? Uh, what, because really, he saw, yeah, but he just, saw something we, in him we, that reflected back? It was the worst of George Best. It was the the bitter drunk side of George Best. You know, he was all he would always play Gaza down and, you know, not fit to lace me boots. And, and uh, because someone had inherited, had, had in, was inhabiting that same kind of superstar status. And yeah. I, I think a little bit of empathy from George Best would have been, would, would yeah, have been, would have been nice. Yeah, because George Best was not was not an unintelligent man, so you'd have no, hoped all. he would have worked something out there. But when I met Gazgo, Gaza recently, did I mention I've met him? <laughs> when I met yes, him recently, yes. <laughs> I was so you know obviously on the Spurs show we've we've met endless Tottenham brilliant Tottenham footballers and everything, and I get great people on the Life Goals podcast. So I'm not usually overawed. Obviously, in the presence of you two, I am quite overawed. But right. with Gascoigne, right. it was like, oh my god, I'm going to meet Gaza. And there were two things I was really worried about. One, I thought, I mean, I've always been worried about Gaza. We all, we all have. We're always worried yeah. about him. He's so vulnerable. And I was worried about, one, is he going to be, um, does it, is it going to feel like the entourage around him, the people around him are not that nice and maybe exploiting him? And two, am I going to find that he's a bit of an idiot? That he really is just a, a bit of an oaf and a bit of an idiot. And do you know what? Neither of those things were at all true. It was such mm-hmm. a fantastic thing because he's now got, and I think over the years he has been surrounded by bad people who have attempted to exploit his celebrity for their own purposes. But he had a great set of people around him. He had a lovely manager who is actually living with as, as, a, as her lodger down in Poole, Dawson. Might be telling that she's a woman. She was very, very good with him. They were clearly very close friends, you know. And she had a, a small team with her who were very efficient at doing all the pictures and the videos and all that. So it was a business. And the other thing about whether he was an idiot, not an idiot. Really, really smart. Really sharp, witty, on it. Loads of stories. Very, very. And uh, both those things were really a revelation, but also mm. an enormous relief. It was, it was great. So I hope, I mean, he's, God knows he's had his ups and downs. But I hope because this was only this is only two or three months ago. So I very much hope that, um, you know, he's over the worst and maybe he's found some stability and peace in his life and he can um, get himself together because it's been it's been tough for him. That's for sure. 
She, and he he doesn't take a penalty. No. And he was a he was a no. fabulous penalty taker, but they decide yeah. that had it gone beyond the five, then at one point he might have had to had to have have done so. But he doesn't take a penalty. They take him out of the firing line. But right. you look down the list of the England penalty takers, and you think there's some very very good penalty takers there. So mm. as as the penalties are happening and 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 momentum is building, the thing that's worrying me is their keeper is getting closer to the penalties than our keeper is. Shilton mm. has decided not to pick a corner. He's decided mm. to stay still and gamble that one is going oh. to be within within his reach. And against yeah. the Germans, I think that was probably a mistake, you know, because you know the Germans are going to they're going to keep their cool and they they're going to put them in the corner. So mm. he's not stopping one. And he's not looking like stopping one. But as the England penalty takers step up, I'm thinking we're all right here. And then it's our fourth penalty, and it's Stuart Pearce. And I'm thinking, we're definitely all right here. Yeah. We've got no problems here. That that was the most confident I felt in the entire mm -hmm. process. And then. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you expect him to break the net with it, don't you? Because it was just so, so powerful. You know, his shot, he had, those, he had a shot like Roy the Rovers, didn't he? It was like uh, that left foot was just like Roy's, what was it? What is it? It was called Roy's something. Right? Roy's Rocket. That's what Roy's left foot was called. It was like that. So, yeah, he was the last person you expect to score. Also, he's so so much grit, such a kind of paragon of masculine sort of ruthlessness. Mm -hmm. You think he's got, there's no way he's going to miss. And then, of course, actually, people forget, but he was in tears at the end of all people. But no, I mean that obviously that didn't that was never the story. But he was absolutely yeah. inconsolable. He was, mm. I mean, I was there uh, six years later when he scored for his redemption. You know when it's he scored, fine. I was in the yeah. stadium. And he went crazy. His reaction. Yeah. Oh yeah. my god! Where he went absolutely, yeah. it all came pouring out. Six mm. years of yeah. agony and shame and guilt and all the rest oh. of it, and he was going crazy. With the they're whole they're all things. things aren't they? They're all because the only way that it ends if it, if, is if someone makes a mistake. If if, yeah. if no one makes a mistake, yeah. it, never, it never ends. Yeah, it never so, ends. Like someone Absolutely. has to be the villain. So yeah. then we need we need Chris Waddle to score, and we need Shilton yeah. to save 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 the last one. Uh, yeah. And uh, if you look at Waddle's penalty, it is the classic example of what happens when there's too much adrenaline. No one has ever missed a penalty for hitting too low, mm -hmm. but the keeper can save it. If you get it in the top corner, it is unstoppable. There's no yeah. way. And his penalty is 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 close to being in the top corner. It's well mm. struck. But with the tension of the occasion, you just calibrate it. You just put a little bit too much on it. Mm. And it's over the bar and sailing away. It wasn't actually over the bar by very much at the point that, you know, it, it, it climbs afterwards. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and then, then, it, then it's all over. Cruel, 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 cruel. I'm happy that two of them missed. Yeah. Yeah. Makes it better, better that way. It? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they can share the pain. But what happened then was that this was the preamble to a plethora of penalty shootouts in international tournaments. I don't know whether the... England lack of belief when it came to penalty shootouts. I'm thinking more for the players than for the country. Started at this point. Can, can one extrapolate that you know that was a hoodoo or a monkey on the back of the players subsequently facing penalty shootouts? Well, we we the next World Cup because we didn't we didn't go to '94. The next one, '98, we lost on penalties as well to Argentina, and Glenn Hoddle that they they hadn't practiced penalties. Yeah, he'd said that you can't, you can't. There's no point. You can't, and if that's true, then there's no point in practicing anything. <laughs> no, I, I heard, I heard Klinsman talk about this, um, and the way that when he was coach, he prepared the team for penalties, and he he would add tension. Mm -hmm. The one who misses has to do all the washing up, or the one who misses. Mm -hmm has to buy a meal for... It's obviously not the same thing as missing in front of a worldwide TV audience of millions and millions. But he would find ways to stack up the tension. Uh, and, and so clearly you can you can prepare uh, 
Yeah. You, you can practice it, especially as, and this is something that Lineker uh, often says, you just got to know where you want to put it and don't mm -hmm. deviate fall into the yeah. temptation of changing your mind on that, on that, that yeah. dreadful walk up, you know, that's where I'm going to put it. That's where, where, where I put it. And if you're a really, really good penalty taker, you can do that. You know, you can change your mind and put it, put it the other side and fool the goalkeeper. But the people taking penalties in penalty shootouts, very often they're not penalty takers on a, on a, on a regular basis. Yeah. So yeah. It, it, it helps enormously if they've got a, a method. They can have two or three places where different types of penalties, but don't deviate from that. And obviously that, 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 that's something that, that, that can be trained, obviously. Yeah. Do you know, I mean, I, that now they, the preparation is so meticulous, isn't it? The England team, apparently, they, they practice everything, including how you walk to and from the spot. Who they had a buddy to come and you know accompany them for all the psychological. The psychologists got really really involved. It's a complete opposite of what Hoddle said. But they, I mean, to be fair to Hoddle, these things do they do uh, evolve, don't they? Sports psychology and um, I mean, of course, if they'd won that shootout, no one would have ever remembered that Hoddle said you can't practice them. You know, <laughs> it would have been and, would have been yeah. a quote that never got never got repeated. But um, yeah, now it's an absolute science in itself, isn't it? And it should, and it has to be. And there's every likelihood you're going to, I mean, most teams, I don't know about most, but a lot of teams that win tournaments have come through at least one penalty shootout to do it, sure. haven't they? I, I think the Germans were practicing penalty shootouts um, ahead of this Italian 90. In any case, they were ahead of the curve on that. Mm. But mm. what, and I think I'm the only one, I think I'm right in saying I'm the only one amongst us who has taken uh, penalties against a top light, top flight goalkeeper. Well, it's true. Oh, yeah. It is true. <laughs> uh, Shane I, I, Given I will remember it. I once had a chance to take him against Goico Chia, who was Argentina's goalkeeper in, in this tournament. And he was that's all he did. He was just a penalty-saving specialist. I, I was too scared. I ran away. I thought, I'm not doing that. Oh. Mate, it's not easy. And I'd I was wearing nice shoes. shoes. Wearing well, nice shoes. Well, I wearing room his shoes, missing well, the penalty against uh, <laughs> against Goiko Chia. My experience was the goal doesn't look as wide as it no. looked before. Right. No. Shea Given but who was are you? standing there. It was Shea Given. Okay. Who's not the biggest of keepers. He's not the but nevertheless, team. a good one. It's definitely a good one. You know, when you were saying a moment ago, you know, the psychology of having a buddy walking with yeah. you towards a penalty. Okay, I didn't have any of that, but he's playing mind games with me. The guy say, <laughs> "Okay, are, are you gonna, are you gonna, are you gonna whack it in as hard as you can, or are you gonna place it?" And I'm like, "I just don't know." I just don't know. <laughs> We'll cross that bridge when we come to it. I, I tried everything. I tried. In fact, he gave me a few extra penalties to redeem myself. And uh, it's not because he's playing tricks with you. And imagine as well if you're facing a hostile um, crowd behind that goal mouth as well. On uh, top of yeah, you, yeah, you can yeah. say as much as you like. Don't look at the crowd. Don't look at the goalkeeper. Yeah. Don't look at. But they're at the back of your mind, and it's not as easy yeah. as you think. Um, or is it not as easy as one may think, because the goal is huge and the goalkeeper mm. can make hundreds of mistakes. But the thing is, they don't quite make a mistake. It's all, it's, the ball is in your court, like Tim was saying earlier, to place the ball at the yeah. far corner of either end so yeah. that they can't so, quite so reach they it. They can't get it. But, and yeah. you're thinking so, about the speed at which you're kicking the ball. I'm not, I'm not a great footballer, but nevertheless, I was thinking about all of these things. Okay. If I can get it in that corner and I kick it hard enough, he isn't going to be quite able to reach it. Somehow, yeah. for him, it was just like stretching his hand out to catch it, stretching his hand <laughs> left or right, and it didn't seem to have any impression. You know, it didn't make I mean, any impression. 80, I think I'm right in saying 80% of penalties are scored, and that is because it's not a fair battle at all. If you do it right, like you said earlier, Tim, the only way it ends is if someone makes a mistake because, yeah. in fact... If you do it right, you're going to score because the goalkeeper's got absolutely no chance. That's the, that's why a penalty is given when you when you someone's fouled in the area because you you want to give someone an eighty percent chance of scoring. But Dalton, I'm I, I'm interested to know what the occasion was where you were, where you were taking a penalty against. Oh, it uh, was some given. it was some BBC Five Live thing, and he was there. It was a charity kind of thing, and okay. you know I, I suppose I was giving it a bit of glamour because they were still doing it in the middle of the night. 
at um, Media City in uh, in Manchester, in Salford. So they dragged me out of my studio to sort of like, sort of say, oh, we're still doing this and come down and, you know, now Dot and Addy Bio is about to go. <laughs> Mate, like, it was oh, not Hold easy. on a minute. I bet you, I bet you Shay Given um, still remembers that because I was begging him, give me another go. Just one more, <laughs> just one more. Because you're thinking, I've got to be able to score from a... No, it's not as easy as you think, mate. Um, no. But we, we've come to the conclusion of the match itself. You mentioned the consequences earlier on, uh, both of you actually, uh, talking about this was the start of the uh, Premier League or something, or this was a foundation for the start of the Premier League. Just how did this match end up being um, so... Uh, so profound, if you like, for English football. Well, someone has to pay for these new expensive tickets. And this this game... Is that it? <laughs> well, that, that, yeah, this game helped create a market of people who will be willing to, 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 to pay because... I mean, to see to Gaza? Like, yeah, but in football generally, when people wanted to, 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 to go to the stadiums, to, to be back in the stadiums, we were paying... I was playing like, like three fifty, four pound a match at Tottenham. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then yeah. sudden, suddenly it goes up to uh, goes up to twelve and fifteen, and you know that, that was a big increase. Uh, so you you yeah. had to have people who were, who were prepared to, to to pay it, and this game and this whole tournament it helped create create the market. It brought it to the mainstream, and, and I think it, there were other things that happened. Tim mentioned earlier that, or, or one, uh, maybe it was you, Dutton, about the. It was only a year after Hillsborough, so Hillsborough gave you all-seater stadiums, so that changed it. The, the the tickets necessarily became more expensive, but also that game just a few weeks after Hillsborough, the uh, the Anfield game. If you talk to people like Greg Dyke and Brian Barwick, who have both been on my podcast, they'll tell you that it, suddenly a light bulb went up uh, on above people's heads because that game was on, was live on television on a Thursday night. And it was huge. I mean, the whole country was talking about it. It was an amazing, amazing football event, obviously still the greatest sort of end to a, to a league season. But um, suddenly people are thinking, hold on a minute, all these people are tuning in here for this top flight game. Yeah. I mean, maybe maybe we should we could be onto something here because it's actually, Indeed. you know, this is a product that already exists. All we've got to do is turn up with some cameras. I mean, I always think that's the funny thing about the Premier League is I've, I've worked in Premier League football clubs. When the Sky people come through the door, everyone in the club is like almost like this. Yeah. Like people who are normally like swaggering around, they're like, ah, oh, it's the people who bring the money. And it's like the yeah. Sky people are almost metaphorical. They're bringing in wheelbarrows full of cash. Because when you think about it, those guys, would be they'd be playing a football, they've been doing it for over 100 years, playing a football match every week anyway. The only thing that's changed is that these people turn up with some cameras and, yeah. and film it. And I think it was because Italia 90, first of all, there was that game, the, the Liverpool-Arsenal game. But then Italia 90 was such a huge television success yeah. i mean everyone remembers the title everyone remembers pavarotti pavarotti yeah. i mean yeah. Yeah. pavarotti right. a crossover hit for pavarotti if it wasn't for that yeah. he'd still be an and opera singer but he's beyond he's a world you know in this country is an mm -hmm. iconic figure because of that you know everything yeah. crossed over and then of course also the thing that was going to happen anyway was the advent of satellite television and sky yeah. he's already started his satellite television it's not going well they're not selling dishes because no one's going to wants to buy a dish and pay the subscription just for Hollywood movies, which is what his gamble was. Mm -hmm. And suddenly he's thinking, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, absolutely And then right. they had that famous auction. They had the famous auction for the rights where ITV and the BBC and Sky are all bidding for the TV rights. It's like a, this is not long after Italian 90 where they've all tweaked. Oh, hold on a minute. There's something in this. And they have the sealed bids. And <laughs> Alan Sugar's in the meeting as chairman of Tottenham. And they open the sealed bids and ITV have put the biggest bid in it. And they go, oh, well, ITV it is then, gentlemen. And Sugar's gone, wait a minute, hold on a minute, hold on a minute. He's run out, he's found the phone, he's phoned up Rupert Murdoch and gone, you stupid idiot, ITV a bid, because Sugar makes the dishes. He actually makes the dishes, you know. Get a bike over here now with a different bid. He goes back and says, wait a minute, lads, I think there's been a mistake with the uh, Sky bid. I think they put the wrong one in. Anyway, they're sending <laughs> another one over now. And Sky... And I've, you know, when you talk to people like Brian Dyke about this, uh, Greg Dyke, they pretty much confirm it. They don't like to say for certain. Yeah, they don't want yeah. to say it categorically, but that because that that's but there's something ethically 
bit wrong about a sealed bid auction where you get to get another bid when you realize yeah. you've lost but that's what happened and that so it changed so then once it's in the premier league then it becomes a snowball sky have got it they're paying huge amounts of money english clubs buy the foreign the top foreign players for the first time you know took the a stadiums while. get better yeah. it took okay. a while yeah first of all they did get the retired ones yeah the older ones i remember year, year on 90, Klinsman. euro 96 oh. was was crucial for this yeah that After was the, the Euro, next stage, wasn't it? then yeah. the, the, the players are coming and looking at English. Wow, these stadiums are all right. There's money here. There's there's money in, yeah. in their hills. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. It, it didn't happen overnight, but and it was, valleys. No, yes. <laughs> yes, and and valleys. <laughs> well done. That's uh, that's an <laughs> uh, reference to uh, the struggling. Nicely, struggling nicely done. <laughs> well, I try, but I think your analysis, Theo, is spot on. You know, because right. some of that I remember actually. Uh, Greg Dyke mm-hmm. was my boss for years and years and years, and right. I remember him always saying, "You got to pay for sport. We got to pay for sport. You got to pay top dollar for sport." But mm. that's the right thing to do, and the rewards are great. And I remember hearing Rupert Murdoch. Obviously, I didn't hear it from him, but hearing Rupert Murdoch saying that his formula for Sky was simple by the sports because that's the mm. one um, spectacle that people are prepared to pay for um i mean things have changed slightly the, the the model now for tv and movies is more kind of a netflix model they become the studio and you want to see it yeah. so people are prepared to pay for netflix now but they had to change things around and maybe bite off the sporting model that had been built up through the premier league and other leagues mm-hmm. around the world as well i i think your analysis was amazing actually theo listen was, can was, we talk was about the bbc um failing absolutely dismally as a as a comedy writer at the time when murdoch's ca- uh, channel launched you know late 80s and the bbc people are all taking a piss out of it you know the production value yeah look, look how crap, it is. Yeah. and I, I remember yeah. telling them and it, it's probably the last time that you you understand the world you know that you understand what's going to happen i remember telling them mm. they're going to do you on sport they're going to do you on live on, on live mm. sport because it, it's the one mm. thing with the potential of people shelling out for 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 the collective experience, and and here we yeah. are. And I think they're still doing the BBC on sport. You know, um, BBC have had to crank up and take a lot of you know Sp- uh, Sky's lead, particularly on the conversation around sport. And you know, 90, Italian ninety ninety or Italian ninety um, was significant for me certainly because of the conversation around it. You know, it wasn't as much about the football people were talking for days and days and days and days about yeah. whether it be about the matches or about gaz or any particular player or you know otherwise um it took a national team to do well in the world cup for us to be re-engaged with sport when a lot of people like you mentioned margaret thatcher and others were trying to tear it down i remember Chelsea being the first stadium I went to, Stamford Bridge being the first stadium I went to where I was shocked at the ticket prices. Um, for some reason, I blamed it on, um, well, uh, uh, David Meller, uh, David Cameron, uh, or Tony Blair, because suddenly they all started sporting Chelsea, these people. And what you said about Pavrossi as well, Tim, Nesson Dorma, I think, kind of because of Time, and it is loved by football fans generally. Yeah. But I think it enabled people like the Toffs to come into football and uh, start enjoying it and feeling like, oh, well, it's a spectacle like going to the opera. Not quite, but you know what I mean? Um, yeah. But yeah, it seems like a, it seems like an eternity away. But mm. actually, when you, the, the way you described it, both of you, it feels like we are seeing the pieces of the puzzle today yep. from uh, yeah. Italian 90 that hasn't gone away. And I think it will be there for every, kind of like 1966 for another generation, mm-hmm. the moment you mm-hmm. remember. Can we talk about the charts, though? Because, you know, my missus oh, is yeah. in it. Have I mentioned that Great. already? Okay. I'm not sure. Um, I don't think so. <laughs> well, she's not number one. <laughs> Yeah, Elton John is some bloke called Elton John is number one. Oh well, somebody had to keep. Which her off what the song service, is it? Uh, sacrifice. With the Elton... the, the yeah. sacrifice, sacrifice is, is yeah. having to listen to it. 
<laughs> that was a little bit cheeky. It will allow that, though. It will allow that. Okay, never mind. It could have been sacrifice. so good. I thought it was if it wasn't, right. if, if it wasn't for the seventies, you know, El, the, the, the yeah. Elton John, he could have been so good. And then yeah. the seventies come I along think... and Stadium Rock and uh, the absurd, the absurdity of the whole thing, and he just he just takes a deep dive into into that. Well, he's still a great songwriter, but look at what's the number two. Look at what's the number two, Ness and Dorma. World Emotion. Oh, Ness and Dorma, no, yeah. Ness and Dorma. And it's uh, peaking at number two. Uh, mm-hmm. Been in the charts for four weeks. I, I was sure that it got to number one, but maybe it didn't. But if you don't mind me starting with number three, I'll, I'll go on to number four in a moment. But number three, it must have been Love, Rock Set. Of course, <laughs> these were the Swedish, the new ABBA from Sweden for you. Um, the the duo of the the woman marie frederickson's not alive anymore sadly per gessley is the the bloke um i have skin in this landscape because arguably i was a competitor to per gessley's previous band yilla natida um when he was a teenager it was like a teenage you know uh teeny bop band and they were very successful their most famous track was uh, your set a poor flicken a poor tv tour uh, which was about the girls on on uh tv2 the you know second channel in sweden it was a little kind of ditty it was like a humorous ditty but having said that little did i know when we bumped into him just once on our tour on a tour they were either going into a studio or coming out of a studio, and we were either going in or coming out, doing the opposite of what they were doing. Um, I never thought that he would make it to become an international star, but this is a real uh, moment where you reinvent yourself and you show your true colours. He was a better songwriter uh, with Roxette than he was with um, with Gil and Atida. Yeah, anyway, I what didn't did you, you were, Didn't realise that you were competing with with him. I, I thought you were competing with with Johnny Wanker and the Masturbators. <laughs> I've read your book. Yeah, you've read my book. Read, yeah, yes, yes. I, I will see you. He's absolutely right. Seminal band. Seminal yeah. band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And all. Yeah, yeah. Moving swiftly on to Craig McLaughlin. They a great book. cover of uh, the uh, James hit. I'd rather go blind. Well. <laughs> <laughs> If I'd known, if I'd known it would fill you so much mirth, I'd have written more about Johnny Wanker and the Masturbators. Uh, yeah, Johnny Wanker uh, wasn't a nice guy, put it that way. Oh, but he was, a, he was a masturbator, though. <laughs> anyway, uh, Craig McLaughlin, uh, you might remember, was a. This is, this is the Aussie Davis. soap in your, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, With some record company the curly woman. Hair and well, they were trying to break him so hard that this woman, a nice woman, I seem to remember, and it was at so, was it RCA? Maybe RCA uh, Records, which at the time was just in Soho Square, uh, were trying to convince me that this was the next big thing. And we all knew it was shit. Mm-hmm. We all knew it was shit. I mean, that track is essentially um, a, the rhythm, of course, is an old Bo Diddley track or one of the many Bo Diddley rhythms out there. But it is an exact ripoff of a track called Willie and the Hand Jive that amongst others oh, yeah. uh, Cliff Richard yeah. covered you know yeah. I'm gonna tell you how it's going to be you're gonna give yeah. my love well it's yeah. that as well I'm gonna love yeah. you night and day yeah not fade yeah. away the way the Rolling Stones did it but it's essentially mm. Willie and the Hand Jive yeah. which is it's a, and, well, and his latest flame yes you're absolutely right so in 1990, they were basically trying to regurgitate tunes from the 1950s because people who didn't have original talent could ride off. But, the but back it, of it. it was totally sanitized. It? It's, te- it's from 100%. the 1950s without any of the danger, without any of the threat of of the original kind of Bo Diddley stuff. It's all kind of sanitized yeah. and sweet. And I think we've, we've yeah. probably spent too much time talking about it and not enough time talking about New Order World in Motion, which is. Let's another, do that, number which, six. Which, it, it's another, it's a cultural changer, isn't it? It's a game changer, yeah. this one. The first good football record. And f- p- arguably the last as well. Perhaps. It was actually a well, really good record, wasn't it? Yes. Funnily enough, I started listening to Vindaloo the other day because Tim has been raving <laughs> on about it yeah, for no, ages I, I like and ages and ages. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, no, you I get like it. it I, because it's, I totally it's, get it's, it. it's, it's nice. It's good, it, but it's not good. Good, is it? I mean, no, it, it, it's good in, 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 in that there's there's a there's a multiracial message behind Vin. Yeah, yeah. there's lots yeah. of yeah. things to and admire. Up. And yeah, it's good that the that. the video to it is a parody of the old Verve walking down yeah, Hoxton yes. Street. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah. Yeah. Like that as well. It's fun. It's fun. And it's got yeah. a kind of like a chant to it that we can all uh, join well, it's in. It's banal well, enough for football terraces, isn't it? But World in yeah. Motion isn't banal at all, is it? And it, it's, no, it's art. It's just really good. It's bloody great. It's just and a great is record. It, is it Main as record. great? Yes. Is it as great as the number nine track? MC Hammer, You Can't Touch This. Yeah, well, it's, it's, that has got a killer hook, hasn't it? Dun, it's played, dun, yeah, dun, but it's Rick James, isn't it? It's Rick James. It is. For it is. Well, right, it is. But... Well, hang on. Hang on a mate. There's, there's no emotional <laughs> whip there, is there? Well, hang on a second. Let me just... No. <laughs> You're absolutely no, right. It's You're Rick James. Um, what was Rick James one called? It's about the She's guy a, you wouldn't yeah, want to take uh, to your you mother. Take to your mother. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> but... The thing that Rap was doing, and this is Rap from Oakland, California. I just got a job at the LA Times in Los Angeles, and they sent me up to Oakland to go and interview MC Hammer. Uh, this was before it broke out here. So I was living in LA at the beginning of this year, 1990, and um, met this guy. And they kept saying to me, oh, you know, uh, you love it. He's a great dancer. He's a great dancer. That is what they kept, because I never heard of MC Hammer at this point. So I go up there and the guy's not wearing the baggy pants that he made famous uh, on the video and everything, but he is an amazing dancer. But more importantly, the people around him, including his elder brother, I seem to think it was, uh, were great selectors. You know, the selectors at the dance hall were the people who identified exactly what part of the song is going to make the audience move. And like you said, uh, Theo, dun, 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 dun. Da, 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 you can't touch this. That was what yeah. people were interested in. Nobody cares about the verse. Running around the world, doing mm, yeah. this and that. Yeah. No, it was da 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 yeah. And he caught the yeah. moment. And yeah. that track ended up being so big right around the world that within the space of the year in which since I interviewed him, he was worth over $100 million. Wow. That's, that's how amazing. big that was. Yeah, That's he bought incredible. racehorses and everything, lost a lot of the money because bad investments. So I think his brother has some blame to take in that part of it. But just within one year of one track, and that's no doubt paying um, Rick James and everything like that, that song yeah. just, it's just, I mean, people can't imagine it now. It was just everywhere. It was, yeah. it was the um, pop sound of the time, which is an achievement for a rap record, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. In fact, that's probably one of the tracks that broke rap to a wider audience because mm. he comes from Oakland, the big shot in Oakland, because gangster rap, as we know, was West Coast. That's where it was introduced. It wasn't introduced by NWA. They took their lead from a guy called Too Short, who was from Oakland, California. He did a couple of albums, Life is Too Short. I, seemed to, I interviewed him as well, actually. He was a cool guy, cool guy. A little bit, you know, a little bit peeved that somebody like MC Hammer had come and stolen his crown as being the big rapper from Oakland. But uh, Too Short, and he was named that for obvious reasons, Too Short <laughs> used to sell his records out of the boot of a car. I know people say that, and to a certain extent, it's hype. I don't think he was selling his records out of the boot of the car when he was selling hundreds of thousands of units, but that's how he started. And that's how their sound, the Oakland sound started. But then it was uh, minimalist initially, then MC Hammer came and said, no, no, it's not gonna be minimalist anymore. It's actually gonna be profound. It's gonna be funk. And that's where mm. Oakland rap still kind of um, navigates its landscape till today through funk rather than, um, and West Coast generally, rather than sort of electro beats as they were doing there. Does that all make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Yeah. And it, 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 it's an education. Although you give us Oakland and we'll give you Manchester. Go it's, on then, Dirty Cash. No, I was thinking less, okay. uh, less Dirty Cash and more, well, there's New Order, but also yeah. this, this is the peak of the happy mondays i think step on is 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 on its way down kinky afro is the next one that, that that's coming along this is where and they're obviously not built to last are they they're obviously not built no. to last yeah, and i love that story of them them uh, recording with is it uh, tina and chris out the talking heads 
Yeah, Tom and, Tom Club. And, yeah, and, yeah, and Tina and Chris. Tina Weymouth. Yeah, and Chris. Yeah, the, Chris yeah. Friends. Ooh, ooh, come on. yeah that's Chris right. Friends. And and Tina and Chris saying, "Well, we thought we'd seen everything in New York. We, we, thought, <laughs> we, we, we thought we'd seen people oh. capable of testing any limit." <laughs> But we've yeah. never come up with uh, uh, against people for whom the concept of the limit was an entirely alien concept, you know. Uh -huh. So they weren't built to last, Sean and the guys. But it, it was an important moment, didn't it? That the, that, that that kind of indie dance yeah. crossover. Absolutely. Um, and actually, you know, the charlatans I noticed here were in at yes. number 19, who were very much of that ilk, weren't they? That was a, they were good. And that was a really good song. They're, they're a little the bit more rooted, I think, in, in 60s. Oh, yeah. like, uh, they would call themselves the Spencer Davis Group on E. Uh, right, which is sounds very appealing. Yeah, well, for me, who's just been in the studio with, uh, um, you know, the Spencer Davis group, or at least uh, their uh, protagonist. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, I yeah, would this, say this is, this is the uh, fifth uh, time you've mentioned this, and every time I get more. <laughs> only, only the fifth time. <laughs> yeah. Sure, only the fifth time. No, sure, I've mentioned did, it more. Well, not since not to only the first today because it's the first I've heard of it. But Stevie Winwood, you've been in the studio with Stevie Winwood. Yeah, oh, well, please. you know, when your, <laughs> missus, when, when your missus is at number 66 in the charts uh, with a jazz version of Dinah Ross's I'm Still Waiting that she did with Courtney Pine, then, you know, at some point or other, you're going to bump into Stevie Winwood the at his studios Stevie in Cheltenham yeah. that he bought when he was 19 years old, along with a huge wow. uh, farmhouse and... Uh, thousands wow. of acres, everything you can see all around it, S's and all. Uh, bought it at the age of 19, you've got to give him the props for that. But God, what did you yeah. think of I'm Still Wasting, Courtney Pine and Carol Thompson? It's lovely. <laughs> it's a lovely version. It, it, it makes, me th makes me wish that maybe they'd have done more stuff together. Yeah, they should have. And they're still good friends, but Courtney Pine base, is based more in the Caribbean now. I'll tell you what I always think about with this, if I might. Um, you know, It's made I, I know for her voice, going this off. song, isn't it? I think you're right. She she's the closest thing in reggae to a Diana Ross type of voice or with, Supreme style with of more voice. body in the voice than than, than Diana. Yeah, she's she, she's obviously a better singer than Diana. You know that, but <laughs> I would say that. But um, Diana's obviously got the biggest success. But I went to, with my missus to Barbados. She was doing some gigs out in Barbados, and I got to go with her. And they wanted her to do like a TV thing, you know, Barbados TV and everything. And we're sitting there, and this woman presenter of this program doesn't know who my missus is. You can't even, you know, my missus is sitting there wearing dark glasses, like I am the superstar, but she ignores <laughs> my missus completely and is talking to one of the other artists. And then uh, she then turns to my missus like, who are you kind of thing? And then she suddenly twigs. Oh, you're the girl on the Courtney Pine record. Oh, my God. You're the girl on the Courtney Pine record. And then goes off. The, the angle of the conversation uh, changes somewhat. She starts giving us some re respect. It's a great track. And you've got to track. give it to Courtney. Courtney pulled out the best in his um, saxophone playing with this. When I lived in L.A., Courtney Pine came over, you know, and um, I went to interview him on a Saturday afternoon just after midday, he, he was going to play that night at this restaurant. So he was huge over here, but in the States, he's, he's trying to earn his stripes. So he's going to play at this restaurant. And it was a really, really jamming restaurant. If you can imagine, you know, thinking of Ronnie Scott's, the famous jazz emporium in the centre of London, it's like a restaurant, isn't it? It was it's kind of like that. So you're more or less on the same level as there mm -hmm. isn't a stage. You're more or less right. on the same level as the people performing. Anyway, I went and saw... Courtney earlier on in the day and interviewed him out in West Hollywood and he was saying yeah I love you know I love the Yankee um cars he was into all the big you know um five or six cylinder cars and so on and he said um yeah but I'm a little bit nervous about tonight you know and I saw what he meant because the way they did it you know jazz in America that is their domain so the, there are jazz guys who are just ordinary you know, uh, run of the mill jazz guys over there who are on Courtney's level. So Courtney Pine's brilliant saxophonist for us, but over yeah. there he's just on a different level. But all the all the press had come out 
to uh, to see this guy from the UK, who they say is a great jazz saxophonist. So the guy that came out before Courtney, he was just like <laughs> playing his horn like it was nobody's business. And I was standing right next to Courtney as he was blowing, and I could see all the sort of like um, the veins in his neck throbbing mm. as he was blowing. He was literally playing for his life there because he could have been blown mm. off stage, but he held his own, and um, you know. Credit to him as well. As proper t- I've told him that um, a couple of times, so he will accept that that was the you know where he was at at that time for that gig. Talking yeah, of of, th- of of Black Britain, the the year before the summer of eighty nine was soul to soul. It was just wall to yeah. wall, oh, yeah. soul, soul to soul. Now there's a, there's a couple of things. There's uh, someone called Maureen doing a mm-hmm. version of the old Sister Sledge, the old uh, uh, Roger and Edwards thing, thinking of you. Which is mm-hmm. totally, oh, it's a yeah. totally soul to soul version. I don't 100%. know. hundred percent. I don't know if she's yeah. come out of the stable. I don't know. And there's also they all did it, right? Yeah. There's also uh, a, a Stock Aitken and Walker Waterman project. Yeah. Um, Big Fun and Sonia. You've got a friend. Yeah. Which is re- it's yeah. really sweet. It's, it's got Gary Barnacle blowing sax, very reminiscent ah. of Junior Junior Walker. Uh, on you know what does it take to to win your love for me? But that's got mm-hmm. a kind of soul to soul feel as well. Why did the soul to soul thing blow over quite quickly? So quickly, do, yeah. Do, do you mind me taking this, Theo? Or do you want to come in on no, this? No, no. I, you, I don't know the answer to that question. I've, I've often wondered. Well, um, soul to soul, and I knew these guys really well from early days, from when they were playing at the Africa Centre in Covent Garden, as it was then. Um, they called it the centre of the world. They used to play Sunday nights, I seem to remember there. So it was an underground thing to start off with. But the guys in question were a amalgamation of several different underground things that were going on, not just in London, arguably in Bristol as well, because some of the, you know, the Soul to Soul crew, the the people behind the album rather than the people behind um, the live uh, sound system sessions uh, were people like Nelly Hooper, who comes from the Wild Bunch, which was one of those groups that emerged out of Bristol um, at the same time as the likes of Smith and uh, Mighty, Massive Attack, they're part of the same bunch. And they brought in a a ginger-haired, amazing keyboardist called Simon Law, who was able to manage a lot of the arrangements. Because as you will know, if you followed club music often it suffers in its arrangement you know some pop guy comes out and takes an old club song and turns it into a hit because they 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 you know get control of the arrangement sort of thing so it's perfectly arranged he brought in the what was then known as the reggae philharmonic orchestra uh, (laughs) which was founded by michael riley who's now a professor of music at at the university of westminster but initially was one of the backing singers or you know part of the band but nevertheless the uh you know not the frontline singers for steel pulse he was one of those that used to wear the ku klux klan hood on his head and sing cool cool i was walking (laughs) along just kicking (laughs) stones anyway um so they brought in all these different elements of the best of the 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 music that was bubbling slightly under the surface and they did that old trick that brits are known to have done for years and years and years before the beatles even right back to tommy uh um um um, steel steel Yes, yeah, Steele. Thank you, thank you, it's Tommy Steele. I was about to say Tommy Smith for some reason, but that's the <laughs> four of uh, the little white ball. Another story. Runner. Yeah, exactly. Sorry. Any little white, little white ball involved? <laughs> Any little little white little ball. White ball. In you terms haven't, of you haven't little, listened to Tommy Tommy Steele. Tommy Steele for a while now, have you? <laughs> no, I haven't listened little to Tommy. White ball. I remember half the six words. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Tommy Steele, Rock with the Caveman is what I was thinking of. Then the Beatles, basically, oh. go over, take some American music and then um, reinvent it and resell it, repackage it to the Americans. So it was UK club music, which was predicated on American music, but the Yanks didn't know what to do with it. If you say, you know, you're talking about uh, Sonia and Big Fun. Big Fun were awful. Sonia had a great voice, but Big Fun, uh, not sure about them. But um, they... They weren't the only ones. Do you remember Ghetto Heaven by... Yeah, yeah. He remixed called? it. He remixed it. I saw them, that American band, Ghetto Heaven, 
Mm. They were a rock band. Yeah. And, and I saw them get booed off the stage by because an audience. That, were... An audience that was there to see KRS One. And they were on the bill mm. because of the Jazzy B remix of Ghetto Heaven. And he, he he'd spaced it out. But the original is like a heavy guitar. They were they were they Family were black. Stand. That's it. They were a they were a black yeah. rock band and the audience hadn't come to see rock. Didn't want didn't want yeah. no rock. They wanted Jazzy and, B spacey remix. And remember, when a lot of those Yanks came over here, they found a club scene that was very different from their own club scene. In fact, these, this chart is full of American Chicago house music, the very early house music I'm talking mm. about, not you know what house music has become since then, but the huge um, artists from that state, uh, from the American sort of house uh, movement uh, out of Chicago, were a different kind of club scene from the club scene we were having. We were almost a rare groove um, club scene. Remember, Soul to Soul's first track was a track called Fair Play, and it had an amazing vocal by Rose Windrush on it. If you listen to Fair Play, and this is before the polished pop arrangements of Keep On Moving, and back to life. Listen to Fair Play, which was, I think they had four singles in a row. Fair Play was the first one. I can't remember the second one. Wasn't quite there with the second one either. The woman for the second one tragically died. Um, she became a drug addict and stole some stuff somewhere and was being chased across a dual carriageway. She got hit by a car. It was really sad, actually, but I spoke to Jazzy about it at the time. But anyway, uh, then they got... Um, uh, the, uh, the two big hits of Keep On Moving and um, and Back, Back to, Life to Life with Karen Wheeler. But the first one, Rose Windross, you listen to that, the bass dominates the whole song. It's almost like a reggae thing. Mm -hmm. And what happened to club music in the UK, certainly in London at the time, was reggae. Remember, Soul to Soul were a sound system. They were mm -hmm. a reggae sound system with a little bit of soul and everything else reggae had been immersed into the club culture and so you had us mixing beats out of the states and kind of laid back beats out of the states with this like heavy heavy bass um infused uh, music that they had on that first track anyway going back to why it blew up they were on 10 records which was an offshoot of virgin records richard branson's company at the time who were quite hip they were the hippest, you know, them or Ireland were the hippest record companies in the business. They marketed it really well over here. Jazzy B, as always, you know, it's one thing to have the music, but if you've got a cult around the music, if you've got a style of clothes mm. around the music, if you've got haircuts, people now will have what we call the funky dreads, left, right and centre. But nobody that was growing dreadlocks in the before... Um, soul to soul in the 70s and 80s would shave off the sides of their dreadlocks and the back of their dreadlocks i mean i did that i did that there's a shot of me with bobby brown um with my you know locks at the side and back shaved off but that was a huge uh revolution for people who had dreadlocks at the time and they had the clothes they wore the very, very cutting edge of fashion. In fact, they had their own clothes stall in Camden Town. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't cheap. A T-shirt in those days in 1987-88 would have set you back about 30 quid, if you could imagine that for Blimey. a T-shirt. Mm -hmm. I, I, I got one of those T-shirts because I had a girlfriend who loved me. <laughs> Let's leave it at that. And I wore it with pride. <laughs> I wore it with pride. Um, uh, but I couldn't afford one myself. You know, that was uh, the point I was making. But they had this cult that went into it. So it was, a, it was like a movement. The only thing that was missing from the cult was a kind of a phrase to encapsulate it. And Jazzy B came up with, well, yeah, we're a sound system and our, our belief is like a happy face and a thumping bass for a loving race. And that mm. just took off. Mm. When I arrived mm. in America to start working in 1990, January 1990, I got picked up from the airport, uh, driven down Sunset Boulevard, coming into Hollywood. I saw this 20, 30 foot poster of Jazzy B, my homeboy. Can you imagine what that meant? Amazing. Coming down yeah. all the way to the States and my homeboy's on this billboard. And the Americans lapped it up. 
because they didn't hear it as us repackaging their music and sending it back to them. They well, and there, there's, there's enough reg, there's enough reggae in there to make it different, isn't it? Is that space yeah, you're in the music? Right. You're absolutely right, hundred percent. Remember, I got so much work. You know, like you've often talked, Tim, about how you know you you, you struggled initially to make it as a freelance covering football. It was like that with me. Uh, but then suddenly I got all these um, offers of jobs. I mean, they were falling over themselves to get me to write for them in the States. American papers. This is, this is just like John Peel me down. being in, in the States in the mid 60s. Because he's got a yeah, Liverpool yeah, accent. Yeah. You know, so suddenly of people course. are falling over himself, you know, because it was the Beatles. Well, well, with me, it wasn't my accent. It was more, I was at the right place at the right time. I mean, yeah, I knew yeah. Skull to Soul. I knew Jazzy B. I knew Karen uh, Karen Wheeler. I knew th where they were coming from. I knew uh, the others that were around them at the time doing, because it wasn't just Soul to Soul. You could have thrown in Nanny Cherry at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, she was part of the uh, wider sort of uh, Soul to Soul scene. Who else? Can't think of names off the top of my head right now, but there, were, there was a little kind of a movement of yeah. club music i mean well, why did it blow over so quickly yeah because they had the world at their feet didn't they yeah they did um i think um well karen wheeler decided that she wants to go solo and like everybody that decides this they they always hint at the you know some kind of financial thing or whatever mm. i think she made a mistake there she put out an album called uk black which there were mm. a couple of decent tracks on it including it. the title track yeah it, it wasn't it wasn't well basically what she did was the mistake the jazzy b did afterwards and I'll, I'll tell you exactly why it blew over they created something a sound that was different and they invariably lost that sound and reverted to the default house sound for their second and subsequent albums and i don't know how you create a sound like uh, the two tracks keep on moving and back to life. And then you abandon that. The Americans are doing it. Sybil is coming with mm. her versions of Dionne Warwick songs. Yeah. And there are so many others coming out of uh, the States with the soul to soul sound. It was an actual sound, a distinctive sound, but then they just wanted to move on. I, I think that's an artist dilemma, isn't it? Even yeah. Karen Wheeler, like I was saying on UK Black, She's only got one or two songs, including the album mix of uh, the title track, UK Black, because she's got a reggae mix of that, which is even better. But apart from UK Black and maybe one other song, there aren't any other songs on that first album of hers, UK Black, that's utilising the Soul to Soul sound. The public still wants the Soul to Soul sound. I mean, yeah. I saw them at some packed out uh, venues when they were bringing in the little house thing, but you could judged by the reaction of the audience, which ones were the ones that yeah. moved the audience. It's, it's always a dilemma for the artist, isn't it? Are you going to yeah, make yeah. the same album again or are you going to take it somewhere else? Yeah. yeah I, I would mean, say... It, it, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, in any in any field, it's like you make a great film, don't you? And then they then they do a sequel because it's a guaranteed hit, but it's always yeah. not as good. The, the real artist doesn't want to make a sequel. He wants to make something Unless else. it's The Godfather. Yeah, 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 exactly. It's actually even better. That's absolutely the exception that, that yeah. uh, proves the rule, Indeed. isn't it? I mean, look, Martin Scorsese's never made a sequel, has he? Mm -hmm. He doesn't. He'd say, "I'm not. No, I'm not going to make good fellas stuff. We're yeah. going to make something else." Done that one. Done that one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Having said that, what Mark, Martin Scorsese has done is um, not get too far away from his audience, and his audience wasn't necessarily just people who were into get gangster films. His audience was a kind of very intellectual. Uh, film knowledgeable audience yeah. that have kept him. He never gets a bad review. No. He, he does a series on the blues, nothing to do with Goodfellas, mm -hmm. yeah, nothing to do with does, Mean Streets. But it takes guts. he never gets a bad. Yeah, it takes yeah. guts to do what you think you want to do rather than what you think will make you the money. And it's it's one of life's great dilemmas, isn't it? In anything you do creatively, there's always the great the great conflict between do you go where you think the money might be while yeah. you still can while you can. Or do you go and do what you really think would be a great piece of work and everything? And of course, that hardly any people get that great Venn diagram where you do it like Scorsese, yeah. where you get yeah. you're doing great work that's making the money. <laughs> it's fantastic. But even yeah. Scorsese, you know, I had um, John S. John S. Baird on the on the podcast, and he knows Scorsese. And Scorsese said to him, "You're crazy being a director. The directors don't make the money." 
Trust me, I know. <laughs> the director of the Scorsese, <laughs> Scorsese said, people don't go and see Scorsese, they go and see Brad Pitt, I'm telling mm. you. So Having said everybody, that, nobody ever thinks they've cracked it. Yeah, I agree. It's hard to fight against the star, the matinee idol, and they, they are artists in their own right, so we shouldn't forget yeah. that. Yeah. But oh, if yeah. the people that make the real money are probably the producers, Nobody yeah. remembers them. Nobody remembers them. They will always remember no. Martin Scorsese. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. when, when you he's, know, when he's I never going to go hungry, is he? I'm not going to feel sorry he's not, for him. He's not skint. He's, not, <laughs> no. he's a mate of Robert De Niro's as well. Robert De Niro will drop yeah. everything to be in one of his movies. So can't yeah. say. I mean, it's like Quentin Tarantino. You know, he may not be making the bucks, but he is enjoying the celebrity at the moment. You yeah, know, it's just actually Robert De Niro is an interesting one because uh, another director's have talked like this over the years where he De Niro sort of does what they, they, that thing where they do one for them and one for me, one for them, one yeah, for yeah, me. So do yeah. one that's a big money one. And Scorsese yeah. has lapsed into, some people say things like Cape Fear was one for them, which was mm. a remake mm. of an old, mm. and then he'll do something yeah. for himself. He'll make wasn't a documentary about the Rolling Stones. Yeah, no. It wasn't as good. No, because when they do yeah. one for them, it's never as good. Fincher used yeah. to say that, you know, he's a great director, isn't he? Adrian Lyne, who was a great English director who made uh, Nine and a Half Weeks and Fatal Attraction and all of that. And he, he was exactly the same. He'd make one, for, he made Jacob's Ladder, fantastic film. That was for him because he just made Fatal Attraction. When you make one that makes a load of money, they say, Oh wow! You're the guy that makes all the money. You can do whatever you want. That's when you think, oh, "I'll just do. I'll do one for me now. Do one that and loses a fortune, time, but I like." Yeah, yeah exactly, yeah, I, I, exactly. And then next time, you only get one. You only get one of those before they say, "Oh, okay, yeah. then come back, do this for us now." And you go, "Okay, yeah, sure, I'll do one for you now." And that's mate. Quite as a much as as much as much as I would like to continue this conversation, <laughs> I can see from the looks on. Yeah, um, I'm getting, I'm getting yeah, hooks on Tim Vickery. It's lunchtime. It's lunchtime. Yeah, yeah. He's going to get hooked yeah. away. Now. Theo, what an absolute pleasure. I mean, generally, oh. thank you for that excellent breakdown of how uh, this particular match that we've been talking about on July the 4th, 1990, England versus... Down with the uh, British. England versus Germany. No taxation um, without representation. <laughs> yeah, representation, <laughs> if you can spell it. Um, yeah, but how it made it such a huge impact on British football subsequently at least top flight um, English football mm. and obviously by default and all the other leagues as well thank you really appreciate that great pleasure yeah, and, huge pleasure thanks for having me and Tim anytime so we'll speak again